طيب بس بجن ان شاء الله اعوذ بالله من العالم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله uh, welcome everyone uh, my name is Nadeem Siddiqui and I serve as the chairman of the board at the Family and Youth Institute also known as the FYI it is my honor to host a webinar on this critical topic tonight one of the most important aspects of our work at the FYI is to provide research-backed resources for our community to reduce stigma, start conversations, give our community practical tools they need to thrive and be well. And today's webinar, inshallah, is part of our Elder Care Toolkit launch, which you can check out by clicking on the link that should pop up in the chat, inshallah, and it was also in the email that had gone out. Uh, and as we begin here, just a reminder, uh, since people will be coming in uh, from different time zones, different places, if you need to step away for Salah or for any other reason, feel free to step away. Not a problem, inshallah. Uh, just leave yourself on and you can rejoin. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our website uh, later on, inshallah. So imagine yourself getting older. I can very much relate to that statement. I am old now not just getting older, I think I can say I'm old right here. But imagine yourself getting older than that. What do you fear the most? Would you fear losing your independence? Being dependent on someone else for many things? Would you fear burdening other people, not being able to take care of yourself? Would you fear feeling disconnected and isolated from the community? Maybe even your own family. These are real fears. They're not just made up. These are real fears. And unfortunately, many of us are not willing to face those fears. You know, when the FYI was creating this elder care toolkit, we held listening sessions with community members. And I was, I was able to participate in those listening sessions. And with both the elders and their caregivers, usually their children, not always, but the elders and the caregivers. And one of the things that we found perplexing at times is that many of the elders refuse to acknowledge the fact that they are or will be getting older and perhaps even weaker. They do not want to plan for the possibility that they need to rely on others for their daily activities. Some of them just flat out refuse to ask for help. And then when you go and talk to their children or their caregivers, they feel exasperated. Like, what's this? I want to plan. I want to help. I want to take care of my parents. But the parents won't let me. And so there's this gap at times. We all have to acknowledge that as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us life, we will age. With every passing day, we get older. And with old age comes opportunities to interact with new generations, but also there is the increased possibility that we may need others more than we did in our prime. This is simply the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed our life. Older adults are important resources for the young, but also may begin to lose physical and sometimes cognitive health. Inshallah, in today's webinar, we'll explore this journey of elder care. And our panelists will provide tips and insight about what to expect when you're caring for an elder, how to prepare so that you can provide your loved one with the best care possible. So inshallah, today, before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to give a quick rundown of how the webinar will work, inshallah. For the first part of the webinar, I'll pose some questions to the panelists, and inshallah, they'll talk about their experiences, I'll then take a couple of minutes to show you the FYI's Elder Care Toolkit and what resources you can find in it. And at the end, inshallah, be some time to take questions from you. If you're, uh, if you're watching this uh, webinar via Zoom, then you can type the question in the chat. Also, some of you have already provided some questions uh, that were sent out through the link in the email uh, and the postings that were done previously as well. And if there are other ways to submit questions in the chat, then I'm, perhaps we can put that in. Uh, if there are other ways to uh, submit questions, let me know, and I will announce that to the world as well, inshallah. Our goal for this webinar is to introduce this topic to you. It's not going to cover every single aspect of elder care. That's just not going to happen. But we introduce the topic, we introduce this toolkit, we introduce resources that can help you open your mind and understand things and take things further. And inshallah, over time, we're going to continue to update the toolkit and add many more resources, inshallah. So our panelists, uh, we have with us uh, Sister Mariam Khwaja. She is a licensed clinical social worker, as well as 
a community educator with the FYI. Uh, mashallah, she has a private practice based in New York and Massachusetts called Nasiha Counseling. She also works at the Boston Medical Center as a social worker uh, in the Margaret M. Shea Adult Day Health Program, where she works with the elderly and with their caregivers on a regular basis. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Mariam also had the opportunity to be the caretaker for her father, who suffered from vascular dementia before his passing in 2019. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him Jannah, inshallah. And then we also have with us our brother Omar Haider. He's a community activist, a consultant, and entrepreneur with a background in law, education, and banking, finance. He's also the director of the Haider Foundation, a private charitable foundation formed in memory of his late father, Dr. Mahmoud Haider. May Allah give him Jannah as well, who lived with Parkinson's for over 20 years. These are our two main panelists. Uh, in terms, I'll be interjecting a little bit here and there. I also have my two elderly parents living with me for the past five years. Alhamdulillah, my dad's almost 86. My mom's close to 80. My father has Alzheimer's and my mother has Lewy body dementia, which is sort of a combination between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and a couple of other things combined. So Alhamdulillah, we've also been going through this journey of elder care in a challenging way. So hopefully between the three of us, we bring some good experience to the table uh, to, to benefit everybody, inshallah. All right, to start off with, let's just stop at the beginning, right? Caring for an elder care is a journey. It's not a one-time deal. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It can span years. Where does the journey begin? And what are the different phases of that journey? So Omar, if you could start off, maybe talk to us about your father uh, and the journey that you and your family took and how that spanned over time. Jazakallah khair and Nadeem. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to clarify, uh, mashallah, Sister Maryam and, and Nadim are the ones with the expertise. I have some anecdotal experience, which I, I'm happy to share, but they're the experts. So inshallah, uh, I hope uh, I don't blow it for them on this webinar <laughs> with anything that's uh, non-beneficial, inshallah. But um, in terms of the uh, the, the question posed, um, it is obviously a journey. Um, it's a lifelong journey. And, um, you know, it's not just about the point when care is needed. Um, the, your relationship and your familiarity with your loved one is something that you build throughout your life. And uh, it's going to be key when care is needed. Um, of course, from the Islamic perspective, as children of our parents, uh, we know that we are the ones who are obliged and primarily responsible for the wellness of the relationship. Uh, no matter what your parents do, if you can't say more than oof to them, <laughs> then of course they are pretty much always right. And uh, it's up to you to make things right, inshallah. Um, at the end of the day, it's on every one of us to work hard to clear any issues. Uh, we build up baggage in our lifetimes, unfortunately in relationships, we build up barriers uh, to interaction or to sharing of important information and we need to break those down we need to clear those and we need to have as transparent and open a relationship as possible uh you know for example uh, one of our community members here locally uh, god rest his soul in peace he uh received a very uh you know tremendous diagnosis from his physicians unfortunately he didn't share it with his uh, his children uh, some of whom he had uh, you could say maybe not as great a relationship with and uh you know only shared it with the child he was essentially closest to or staying with. Um, that diagnosis essentially was a defined period of time uh, that you know he, he was expected to live. And uh, if he had shared the diagnosis, of course, he would have given the opportunity to his family members from having to have a more engaged involvement in his life from that point on. But he wanted to maintain uh, his dignity, maintain the status quo. He didn't want anyone to feel sorry for him. And unfortunately, this is this is what happened. And this is, in my mind, a tragedy. Um, in our specific case, my father was, you know, Allah he was a very sharp physician who was very well read. 
And even then, I mean, physicians are notor not notoriously the worst patients. Had it not been for a mild stroke, he might not have gotten his Parkinson diagnosis until much later, until it would have made, you know, it, it, not that it would have made a, much of a difference, but he was proactive in learning and seeking treatment options. He also kept us informed and made his wishes and directives clear. And so in that, from that perspective, I feel like our family is so blessed, alhamdulillah. Uh, he also handed over control of his matters over time. And essentially, the decisions that shifted from him to the family as his condition worsened, became better informed and took into account his wishes better. Uh, I think one of the challenges and one thing you mentioned, uh, Nadim, briefly in the, in the intro, is about asking for help. And we know that asking for help is a challenge for most people, let alone our elders. I mean, uh, you know, when I grew up, my father, if he asked us to do something, he would ask once. And if he didn't do it, he would get up and do it himself. And as he got older, he wasn't going to change that, unfortunately. So, of course, we have to be the ones there, uh, you know, before the, the, the need for help is there. Uh, and observing and seeing what's going on and sometimes, uh, you know, trying to find out information that's not being provided to us. It's very challenging. I mean, when, when parents or loved ones are keeping uh, medical concerns or other things from us for good or bad reasons, uh, you know, trying to find those out and then do something constructive and positive about them is key. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, some of the regrets that we have um, from my perspective is not really engaging with, for example, support groups from early on, because there are support groups out there who, you know, deal, who have dealt with, have people who have dealt with what you're going through or your family members going through. Uh, another issue I would advise greatly about is finding out as much as possible about your insurance and other benefits to see what kind of coverage you have. You don't have to carry the load, you and your family entirely. There are professional service providers who may be fully covered by insurance, but you didn't know about it at the end of the day, who can assist with many aspects of the care that is necessary and may improve the quality of life for our loved ones going forward. I think, uh, you know, we, we've got a lot to cover today, but I think um, uh, that's a starting point from my perspective on that. And of course, I'll head it over to Maryam, inshallah, to, uh, you know, provide the uh, clinical perspective. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for having me here, um, Nadeem and FYI. Um, it's a tricky question you're at when you're asking when the journey begins. And I agree with um, with Omar that it's it doesn't, the beginning is, it should be lifelong, right? We should be thinking about these things as Allah has directed us, right? To that death should be a thought in our mind, right? Because it's an inevitability that none of us can avoid. Um, but I think what I've seen in the in the work that I've done over the past 20 years, um, I would say that people really start thinking about their mortality around the time, you know, when when they're starting to think about um retirement, mortality becomes more of a realistic thing, concerns about it, right? Our bodies are changing in a lot more critical ways, right? If things aren't moving as much, we're, we're, we're seeing more of our limitations. And that can be, you know, it, it is difficult to bear and it's difficult to, um, to experience. And, um, and, contend with, right? That we are not going to be our strongest. We are not necessarily going to be able to take care of ourselves, our loved ones. We are we are not going to be the best decision makers for, for different circumstances. These are hard things to accept. So when we're thinking about planning for our own time, right? As we age, we should be thinking about it before we get there before we start saying this, right? This is when we start having conversations. And honestly, it's so much easier to have a conversation about what to do in the future when it's not, when we're not dealing with life, you know, like terminal illness or major health conditions. So when you're starting to think about like in your fifties, I think, you know, um, you know, inshallah, you've got good health and you can, your, your parents are, are well at that time to be able to start having that conversation then. But at that time is when you should be thinking about certain things, right? Um, mentally and emotionally, what, what, um, 
the elderly might be going through is that that's a time when they're starting to size up their lives, right? And they, they're trying to see what kind of life they've led, right? And where they want to be, right? The, the thought of facing Allah, right? Am I a good person? Am I worthy, right, of, of meeting my Lord, right? And so things of legacy, right? Um, and what am I doing with my life is, is, these are questions that start to come up. Also, what happens is that people will think about retirement or stepping down, right? If it's someone who's not working, right? They're, they are stepping down and maybe reducing activities or that's the expectation, but with not necessarily with a plan in mind. And what, what I've seen is that um, so many people, particularly men, right? After they retire, they go through a very quick decline. Right, because they're not they're not challenging themselves physically, mentally, right, mentally, intellectually. So your body changes at a much more rapid rate. So before retirement happens, I would say that there should be conversations about okay, you know, the individual who's aging or with the children or loved ones thinking about what am I going to do once I'm hitting retirement? What are my options? Right. So you know, what, you know, spiritually, where, where do I want to be and how do I want to grow, right? What, what are some things that I can do? You know, when people pass away, there is such a push to kind of do a, um, you know, a sadka jariya for them, right? With, with my father and with many people, right? We just, you know, you might purchase a well and you have that right in their name. And so that they're continuing to earn that, um, that reward. Why not? also planning for the end of our, um, the, 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 the later years of our life, you know, towards of, for the sake of Allah, right? We should be thinking about um, maybe, you know, are we going to do some volunteer work? Are we going to give back to the community? Are we going to learn more? Are we going to, to pray more physically? What kind of activities are we going to do to ma maintain our health and to um, uphold our health, right? So doing walking and things like that, right? These things are so very important. I just met someone who's 88 and she's had a personal trainer for 30 years. And at 80 years old, she's running half marathons, right? She's not brown. <laughs> she's not a Muslim. So this is why these things can happen. But inshallah, we can bring these, uh, these things in our community, right? And we can think about what services and what programs we can have from in, in masjids for the elderly to participate in. So these, all these things will also help to, you know, when we don't address these things and there is a risk of, you know, it, affecting people's mental health. So there could be an increase of depression and anxiety, right? And then problems with the aging. So things like Alzheimer's and dementia are not considered normal healthy aging. It's considered a disorder that that expedites things, right? And so depression and anxiety come a lot with, with these ailments. Um, there could also be psychosis that comes up and paranoia and all of these things can come up when we're not taking care of ourselves. And I'll pass it on to Nadim for now. Yes, well, Sharon. I think one thing that uh, as we talk about the journey also to keep in mind is we've talked about the elders and as we age starting to recognize. But for the caregivers, how do they recognize, right? So there are things that we should start watching out for. So if we are not a multi-generational family, meaning we don't have the elders and the youngers all living together in the same family, Perhaps you're visiting your parents once a week or whatever the time period might be. How do you watch out for signs that elders need help, right? So these are things that you should think about. Um, it could be that, you know, your dad was always on top of things. The house was really well maintained. And then you're starting to notice, hey, the light bulb's been out for two weeks and he still hasn't changed it. Or the mail is piling up. Or you go to your, visit your parents and they tell you, oh, yeah, you paid $5,000 cash to this guy to come and uh, paint the house. You're like, you paid him $5,000 cash? up front to pay come pay for the house like they start making questionable financial decisions of somebody that they've never met etc all of these should be used to us that okay they're starting to have declines here uh I, we need to be more proactive and start planning things because they may not be able to ask for help they may not realize they need the help and so as caregivers we need to be on the lookout for these signs and start thinking about these issues as well inshallah 
Um, as, as we touch on in the toolkit, and, and some of these tips that I mentioned are in the toolkit and we'll talk about them at the end, inshallah. But as many of us know from experience, an older person may not be able to do everything on their own, right? They still want to feel like they have a say in the decisions that impact their life. So what are some tips that you would give to the caregiver, to the caregivers particularly, so the person who's looking after the elders? How can they honor the autonomy of the aging elder of their parent, their relative, as they care for them, but at the same time navigate that, you know what, certain decisions need to be made? Maybe Omar, you want to start off again? Sure, sure. Um, this is, a, I think, one of the most sensitive and critical uh, aspects of you know, um, elder care. At the end of the day, you want not only to, to maintain their um, autonomy, their sense of self-worth, their dignity, and so on and so forth. But you want to maintain their 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 life um, as they've lived it and their legacy, as Mariam had mentioned, because, uh, you know, as she mentioned, in a lot of cases, uh, after retirement, unfortunately, there is a, a drastic decline in some cases. And, you know, uh, retirement can be by choice or can be by disability or otherwise and you know when it's not by choice it's it's a difficult pill to swallow i mean uh you know my father uh, continued trying to practice medicine for years and years and years when you know the benefits from the medications and the deep brain stimulation that he uh, he got as part of his parkinson's treatment declined uh so his ability to you know physically uh, function and do what he wanted uh, became more and more limited. Um, and, you know, notwithstanding that he, he did work for a number of years on a part-time basis, but even that was challenging. And even after that, he, he would have me update his resume. And, and that's one of the things that I think, uh, if I did anything right, one of the things that I, I may have done right with my father was, um, uh, no matter what he requested, I would always be like, yeah, sure. You know, no matter how unrealistic or you know, if we want to be judgmental, we would think it's it's almost silly, some of the, the requests. Uh, so, for example, uh, he's, you know, my dad used to uh, spend the winters with me in Bahrain, and he would ask me for cash, you know, because he's always used to carrying around, you know, cash for whatever needs. Well, I mean, obviously, I'm with him uh, and going with him everywhere he's going. So what's the need for cash? But at the end of the day, I don't think about it that way. I have to think that, you know, that he wanted cash. So here, uh, <laughs> here's the cash that you asked for. Uh, or, you know, for example, um, again, uh, applying for, for open positions or updating his CV or, or doing whatever it is that they want to do in terms of uh, continuing their life in, in a dignified and, and, and a way, a meaningful way and a purposeful way that they have. Um, of course, you know, as they decline and depending obviously on their condition and so on, uh, those things become more and more challenging. But another thing, I mean, with my father, and this is a funny uh, thing, uh, my father's voice, even when he was healthy, was very, you know, um, uh, you know, quiet, but strong. So my my nephew, my, my nephew, his grandson, uh, Ibrahim, he used to joke that Jiddu Abu Omar bi'aki hek. Jiddu Abu Omar speaks like this, you know, with a very rough voice, and that was when his uh, physical condition was well. Um, because of the Parkinson's, you know, his voice became weaker and weaker. And you know, I would, you know, beg him in, a, in as polite a way to repeat what he said many times, and even put my ear right in front of his mouth to try to understand what he's saying in 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 a respectful way, because, you know, for him, it's frustrating to have to repeat himself. It's frustrating, you know, uh, every aspect of that. And, and to, to, you know, to not be respectful or understanding in those circumstances is to, you know, essentially put him down and, and say that he's not able to communicate. He's, you know, not the person he used to be. And so, uh, you know, again, the sensitivities here in dealing with the, the, the loved one are key in terms of trying to, you know, maintain as healthy a relationship as possible, as healthy a mindset as possible for both yourself and the loved one, and hopefully achieve outcomes that, you know, are, are as best as possible. There will be difficult decisions that need to be made, uh, whether it's about, you know, communications, you know, um, transportation, financial, control of things, car keys, driver's licenses, all of those things may come into play where you, you, you may have to take action 
or or do something which you don't want to do and you have to do it in as careful a way and as as possible i mean in some cases you, you literally have to put your car keys away um because you know otherwise your loved one who may refuse to have a cell phone may be driving down the street and get confused where they are where they are um because of their condition um so you know i think um at the end of the day you have to show your loved one that you care and you listen and you agree with whatever they want even if at the end of the day that agreement is only for the sake of that conversation um in order to um you know uh honor their their dignity and 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 preserve it as best as possible and of course to maintain that healthy relationship uh, as best as possible because the challenges are going to increase as time goes. And if the relationship is not a positive one and not a healthy one, it's gonna be very difficult uh, to, to do what you need to do or to encourage them to do what they need to do uh, in many cases. Or you need to uh, touch a little bit. Uh, and also, you know, some ways that what are the, ways that elders can make it easier for others, but also from the, uh, the, the caregiver's perspective, you know, how do you have these conversations in a way that, you know, maintains the honor and dignity of the elders, but at the same time, you're able to have really good decisions made? So I think the preparation before it's needed also makes it so critical because it gives someone, uh, you know, then people are kind of prepared that things are going to change and this is the plan, right? So in the preparation that comes up, what are some things? First of all, having your doctor, right? Being very clear and making sure that there are consistent doctor's appointments. And, you know, in certain circumstances, you know how your doctor is your sheikh, right? Um, and this would be one of those circumstances where you get advice from your doctor and that's, that's, the agreement, right? I um I think a geriatric um, primary care physician is very very important because their knowledge of resources um, and where things are and what tests need to be do they're just a lot more in tuned with things. Um, so so having um getting having that set up and that preparation with your elder loved one that this is what we're going to do, right? talking to them in advance about, okay, who is your healthcare proxy and who is your legal guardian, right? It also, you're creating this mindset that, okay, I'm going to start handing things over, right? And it's not going to be nice and it's not going to be pretty, right? But this is something that we need to do just for their well-being and for everyone's well-being around it, right? Um, and so, and things become challenging, especially when there's ailments like dementia and Alzheimer's and whatnot. It, it isn't necessarily an easy ride, right? There were, when I think about my father, I used to have like daily accusations of me for taking his things and he would be looking for his things. And then he became paranoid about you know, feeling like he was held captive at home and he would escape from the house. We'd have, we had to change the locks on the house so he couldn't exit the house. And that increased his paranoia, but it was also his safety because he would escape and he would have falls and he would be confused. And somehow like we wouldn't know that he's left the house. And so it was really, really challenging for us, right? And I think having people doing this alone, when you are one person doing it, it becomes really, really difficult because then you are taking all the burden on. And it shouldn't be just one person doing this, right? Inshallah, I'm praying that people have family support, right? And you're saying, we need to tag team on this. We can't do this all on our own, right? My mother and I were really, really critical, right? Um, in supporting each other, right? We were a check for each other. If there were things that my, my father done that was getting my mother upset, I'm like, okay, calm down. Maybe you step back, I'll take over, right? And we were able to take care of each other. And it gave the opportunity for us to give someone else opportunity and time for self-care. And then and someone else who's in a calmer state um, came in to help. And it wasn't always successful. 
right? These, the, there, there's, it's very, very intense, right? And we have to be real, like as caregivers, what this does for us seeing our protectors and our caretakers through our entire lives deteriorate to, to what Allah says, like a child, right? And we are taking care of them like they took care of us, right? It's And it's very hard to see that transition. So we are managing our own emotions and then we are holding our our, our loved one through this. So it is it is extremely difficult, right? So it's so important to also have your connection to Allah, right? Through this process, right? And, and having that spiritual outlet, having whether it's family support or friends who can who you can talk to exercising in your own self care um and then also when you're going to the doctors right they can also connect you with other services right you can have right there there are ways you know once you've managed and figured out coordinated the estate and everything there might be the opportunity to get home health aids right that are covered by insurance there might be opportunities for programs that people can go to. I work in a, in a, I'm a social worker in a program where, where the elders come and they are participating, right? In, in like a few hours of activity between two and five days a week. And they do socialization, they get fed. There's, they have different kinds of activities, whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's current events or games or trivia. And they're, they're talking to people, they're walking around a little bit, they're doing some exercise rather than just sitting at home the entire day and not doing anything, right? And so these, all these things are, so all states have resources that we can utilize to help in this support. Um, I think one thing I'd add here is it's, uh, it's, it's a very critical balancing act between being honoring our, our elders and being respectful to them but balancing that with actually getting decisions made for their own safety and protection. You wanna make sure you honor them and, and protect them, but at the same time, sometimes decisions need to be made. And at different points in the journey, it can take different forms. I mean, I'll share, it, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, alhamdulillah, my parents are, are, we live together now. Um, but it took me five years to convince my parents to move in, to leave their own house. And, you know, the first time I spoke to them, hey, mom and dad, you know, think you're getting older, you know, you need a lot more help and support. They're like, no, we can do it. We're not, we're good. It's like, again, you have to honor that. You have to respect the elders. You're not going to push a decision down. And you come back and you say, oh, but you know, I noticed this. I noticed that. They're like, no, we can still do it. We can still do it. But you keep having those conversations. Over time, it sinks in. I, I had the opportunity of time that, you know, I had the luxury of time, I should say, that after five years, they themselves came to the realization that, you know what, things are getting difficult. And I've been at it for five years, like, all right, fine, we're moving in. Here. So Alhamdulillah, they moved in. So it, so whatever it is that you're trying to do, it may not be a single conversation. Be ready to have a conversation over time. And that allows you then that luxury of, you don't have to push something right away, which can feel very disrespectful having a nice, respectful conversation, you're planting a seed, an idea, come back two months later, come back three months later, come back six months later, you know, pick on it again, pick on it again, you know, over time, convince them. And, and inshallah, with good reasoning, you're able to do that. Uh, I think they, the point Maria made about having geriatric care specialists uh, is, is really important. Uh, it makes a world of a difference between what they know and understand and how they're able to put all of these things together I mean, general doctors are good, but they're not specialized in elder care and knowing what some of the challenges the elders are going through. Um, with that, maybe I'll, I'll ask another question that sort of ties into some of the things that we started talking about, that caregiving is a very demanding responsibility. It can uh, lead to a lot of difficult conversations uh, between siblings. Uh, Maria mentioned her and her mother. They were tag teaming, and you absolutely should have a team looking after, and perhaps you can touch on that. But when you have this team, you can have difficult conversations, even hard feelings, conflict, maybe even broken relationships. So how do you manage that? What are some common issues that come up for a family to look after their elder? And how can a family prepare to manage 
this type of conflict. Uh, Maria, maybe we can start with you this time to share some thoughts. Yes. Anytime there is a big stress or a big demand that is placed upon a family, it is always in, an opening for past traumas, past conflict to come up. And it's complicated, right? I think I would say therapy is all around, whether it's family therapy or it is, um, or, or it's, you know, individual therapy, right? We need to take care of our own experiences, right? Um, when there are traumas, there's anger or resentment or hurt about of your, you know, how you were treated maybe by your parents or by different family members. Be, be honest and realistic as our, our families, our parents are aging, you may or may not get that apology that you're really looking for, right? And there comes a time where no one is saying that you you don't have a right to be hurt, right? But honestly, there are times where you're not, you know, to acknowledge that you may not get that apology, but that does not take away your responsibility to your parents, right? Or to your siblings in this, right? So if we make our align our intentions, right, to for the pleasure of Allah, right? And we kind of are realistically just saying, okay, we're really hurt by this person, but they're not, you know, they're not in a space to do that. I know when my father hit me, when he had dementia, it was almost like he was a different person, right? And the way we engaged with him was so different. He became, he became so playful and childlike and, and, and away from his, just like his, his, his stoic nature was gone. He just completely disconnected with that. Right. And so any things that I might've wanted to discuss or something, it was, it wasn't going to happen. Right. His memory was gone, his understanding and, and all of that was gone. Right. And so, but on the other hand, I think that there is, there is such a, there was a blessing in that. Right. Because I got to engage with him in a way that I hadn't done in a very, very long time. Right. And so, and I think that when I think about him and I miss him, I miss a lot of those times when he was actually his, his most ill. Right. Because it was just a very, there was no, that he was just real and he was, he, he was so much more expressive in his emotions. Right. So, so there, there is that. Right. And then on the other hand, right. We can also look at and think about you know, the wrongs that we have done, right? Because nobody is perfect, right? It is still an opportunity for you to seek forgiveness, right? With the intention of becoming closer together, right? And there is healing in that, right? And so, you know, this, this world is not about justice. This isn't where the scales are gonna be balanced. That is for the next life. And we just have to be realistic and say, you know, what, what are we going to get out of here, right? Um, so really trying to, to step with love and kindness, seek forgiveness, right? Um, being, you know, there, there are going to be things, you know, if there's conflict with siblings and everything, we can, it's, it's okay to be direct and say, look, there is this conflict. We're gonna have to put that aside to address this and we need to find a space where we can address the care of our parents outside of that. So how do you, let's figure out how to do that, right? And so collaborating and just and just opening up that dialogue and inshallah, there'll be some headway that's made there. Okay, Omar, could you talk more? I mean, because you had your siblings, everybody working together. So how do you manage the sibling relationship and within the family? And obviously some type of conflict that might come up. How do you manage that? Well, it's tough. I mean, but in some ways we were blessed. Uh, there, alhamdulillah, there's eight of us in our family. And, you know, um, so there's a lot more resources in terms of bodies and financial and otherwise to assist when called upon, alhamdulillah. And everyone was willing to step forward and contribute and do what's necessary. 
to assist. Uh, I think, uh, you know, um, Mariam had uh, spoken clearly about communicating and coordinating, collaborating, involving everyone. And sometimes if you have a sibling who's choosing not to be involved, continue to involve them by just keeping them informed and giving them the opportunity to express their opinions, even if they are not doing their responsibility, they're not carrying their, their share of the load. At the end of the day, you want to leave that door always open for them. You want to, you know, advise them. You want to encourage them, but don't impose on them and don't judge them. I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about circumstances where we're all adults. I mean, sure, we still have our sibling rivalries and everything else, maybe in full force, even 50 years uh, down the line. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have to to respect each other and, and encourage each other and call each other to do what's right. Um in the best way and always again leave the door open for participation and rec reconciliation um you know these are the circumstances where you might have the last fleeting seconds to make things right with your parents and maybe even with your siblings and uh, you know you know for th those, those of us who are actively involved uh, maybe that's less of a concern but for the others we want to encourage and foster uh, as best uh, an atmosphere and an environment and relationships as possible for them. So even if, you know, for example, uh, one of us is carrying the majority of the load, they we shouldn't be closed or negative or anything to others uh, uh, because it's not going to help the situation. I mean, uh, those who we can pressure, we, we, know, we know each other by now. I mean, uh, we know how to encourage each other. We know what works and we know what doesn't work. But at the end of the day, we have to, you know, adjust have a, a larger heart to deal with everything. And I, uh, one other additional point I wanted to quickly mention, uh, which both uh, Nadim and, and Mariam had mentioned uh, briefly, is uh, our own angst or 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 or, or pain of, of dealing with a loved one as we see them declining or changing or everything else. Uh, that by itself uh, is so challenging. And one of the things that I used to do and, and encourage others to do may not be the best thing, but I would say if, if it hurts you so much to look at him as your dad, for example, in our circumstance, then look at him as another person, another family member who you just met and now you have to help take care of them. If that'll help you manage the circumstances a little better instead of being torn and, and having all of your feelings and baggage and everything come to play, do it. Because at the end of the day, you want to, again, uh, you know, deal with them in the best way possible, uh, both them, of course, and the rest of the family. And, you know, the last thing you want is not to uh, have done everything possible that you could do for your loved one before uh, there's no opportunity anymore during this life, of course. I think one thing, one thing that, that's helpful in working with siblings, especially if you have the opportunity to plan in advance, then involve all of the family members in the planning. That allows everybody to give their input as to what works, what doesn't work for them, uh, the last thing you want is something happens and then you throw a responsibility onto somebody who's not prepared for it. And they'll be like, wait, why am I suddenly getting this responsibility? And they were not involved in the planning process. But if, as you're going through this, even if it's, you know, your parents have become older, like suddenly your, your parent is 80 years old and they have a heart attack and now you have to look after them. Okay, that situation is all of a sudden, but immediately get the siblings together and said, all right, now we all need to come up with a game plan here. How are we going to handle this? This is not a one-time deal. From now on, somebody always has to be with mom or dad. Somebody always has to look after them. What can we do about this? And so what is this plan that we involve? So you get everybody involved. It, it, it'll, inshallah, reduce some of the conflict because you know people are not unprepared. They understand, okay, you know, I'm signing up for this. And we're trying to fairly uh, balance our load of work here. And then be open, as Omar said, about challenges that each person faces. Listen. My family circumstances is this, and you know my work circumstances is this, and this is what it does. But work it out as much as possible. But absolutely get the family involved. You don't want to be single if if you have the family and friends available, because otherwise, definitely that burnout can happen. There's only so much load that you can hold, and after a while, that becomes really challenging. Uh, Alhamdulillah, there are a good number of questions that are coming through the chat. Uh, I've asked the panelists not to address them just yet. We'll come back to that and address, I think, in a couple of minutes. I'll actually shift gears a little bit. And uh, if panelists don't mind, I'm just going to walk through uh, 
our attendees through the, uh, the actual toolkit. It has uh, a lot of resources. Some of the questions are actually going to get answered right there. And then we'll come back and then we'll spend the rest of the time uh, answering the questions. There are a bunch of questions that have come in the chat. There are questions that have come online. So I think addressing these questions will be helpful to, to the attendees, inshallah. With that, let me share my screen. And inshallah, this works. And glitches don't happen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. All right. And I'm hoping that you're all seeing the screen right now. So this is the FYI's Elder Care Toolkit, uh, which you can get to the FYI's website, the FYI.org. And then you can navigate to resources and then click on the toolkit section. And then within the toolkits to scroll down and you will come to the, uh, the Elder Care Toolkit. Uh, it has a lot of resources in it and it's an online resource, which means we're gonna keep updating this. As new things come available, we're gonna keep adding to it. So it's a live resource inshallah. It starts off at the top, there's a khutbah guide. If anybody is an imam or a khatib, or if you want your imam in your area to give a khutbah on the importance of this topic, we have a ready-made khutbah with some bullet points that they can use to craft their own khutbahs. There are a couple of articles, you got two important perspectives here, that the caregiver, what are things that you should be thinking about? And then the person is getting older, you know, how do you build your strong, a stronger relationship with your adult child so they can look after you as you get older? So both perspectives, the caregiver as well as the elder, right at the top, we have a couple articles just to start things off. And then we have a bunch of different sections here that goes through the different types of resources that are needed. First, we need to understand what the needs of our elders are, right? And so what are those needs? And how do you recognize? I mentioned some signs. So within the toolkit, you can click on this button here and a section opens up. It will give you more resources that you can read. Anything highlighted in blue is a link to more resources that you can click on and, and, and understand you know, and, and read that resource, right? So I talked about yard care or broken appliances, are there expired groceries, et cetera. There, there are a bunch of different things that you can look at for signs that the elders start needing more care. How do you deal with uh, autonomy and empowerment? How do you deal with their mental health and well-being? How do you deal with the emptiness syndrome that, you know what, as the elders, as you've grown up, you moved out of the house and the elders are home alone. And that over time, and Mariam sort of alluded to that, you know, a lot of that depression, et cetera, comes in. It's like, oh, we're home alone. We don't have as much activity. Our life was so focused around the children. Children have left. So over time, that builds up. What do you do about it, et cetera? So that's a section there. Well, that's how do you recognize the elders need help? Okay, once you recognize that, I need to start talking to my family about elder care. What we were just talking about a minute ago, getting the, the siblings involved. What I mentioned about having more than one conversation, how do you talk to them in a gentle fashion? Uh, you know, leverage different types of support that you have, exploring all the different options that are available, not just what you can do. Both Omar and Mariam mentioned this in some of the comments they made, the, the various states, uh, hospitals, insurance, they have so many different uh, uh, resources available for us to utilize. How do you explore all that? So once you've done that, then you start sharing caregiving responsibilities, yourself and your spouse. That's a, something that we haven't talked about yet. Perhaps in the Q&A, I think one of the questions that came in was, how do you share responsibility with your spouse more? It might be your dad, but your wife or your husband is also involved in looking after them. Your children are now involved in looking after them. How do you balance some of that? And so again, this whole section talks about caregiving responsibilities, and especially for the sisters. I mean, our stats show that two out of three caregivers are female. And that's generally that, where it happens. So a lot of sisters, a load is placed on them. Uh, sometimes a lot of cultural expectations that yes, you're their daughter-in-law, but you're going to look after the, the parent-in-law and, and more look after more than your own parents at times. Like, wait, you are the son. Why are you MIA? Why are you missing in action here? Why aren't you looking after your own parents as well? So how do you balance that? You know, you need to have a healthy, balanced relationship. And this is going to end up perhaps conflict in, in, in the family or in the marriage. How do you deal with this? How do you handle conflict? Again, anything highlighted in blue, there's a whole article on it. You can deal, or you can read it in more detail. And then as you're doing this, how do you avoid burnout so that you are there in the long run to help your parents, your elders? You, you don't want to make, you want to make sure you're not burning out and that you're going to drown and you're not going to be able to help them and they're going to drown as well. So what are different ways you can do that? 
At the end, some additional resources. I mean, we haven't talked about, and one of the questions that came in the chat was, you know, having uh, wills placed in uh, power of attorneys, healthcare. So this very first link, basic checklist for taking care of the elderly, that article goes through in great detail. What are some of the documents that you have to have in place? W what type of power of attorney do you need? How do you get access to bank accounts? Uh, passwords online. I, I knew one person who had a running business, thriving business, had a stroke and it's limitating. The, the stroke now, they're not, they, they have the mind of a four year old because of that stroke. The children had no clue how to run that business. Everything was on that computer. Nobody had the password. How do you get access to that now and all that? So, some basic checklist here of how do you take care of the elderly? What are the things? How do you set up uh, a will, an Islamic will? What are some of the resources that you have available? Again, a whole bunch of other resources that you can go through that are there. And inshallah, as I mentioned, we're gonna keep adding more resources. If you have things that you need that you find are not in this toolkit, please contact us and we'll research the material. As you said, we're a research-based organization. We'll make sure they're solid, they're uh, useful and within Islamic guidelines and we'll place them up here inshallah. So this is the toolkit. I hope uh, folks will get a chance to uh, go through it and utilize it. We've had some really good feedback uh, from those who have utilized it and said it has really helped them structure uh, discussion with their family members, structure their own mindset as to how to go about looking after their elders. And inshallah, it's uh, useful for others. With that, let's go to some questions that have come up. Uh, and I'll just read off the questions as they have come in. Uh, so the first question was about siblings, that you talked about siblings, but each sibling has a different kind of relationship with their parent. Older siblings may be more influential. Younger siblings may not have that much influence on their parents. How do you keep this relationship dynamics in mind when deciding which sibling will play what role? Um, if I may, on. if I may start on that. So if people are sitting together and collaborating um, and all the siblings are getting together and saying, okay, how best do we manage, right? Yes, we can look at different people's strengths, right? So some people might be, you know, might not be able to, to a either have that influence or have the resources to house and care for the parents on a day-to-day, -day. but what are some other things that they can do to contribute? Can they give some money on a monthly basis? Can they buy families clothes? Can they prepare food and, and drop that off? Can they pay for cleaning services or can they help take them to the doctors and things like that? So there's so many different needs of, you know, of that loved one, that there are different tasks that can be done, right? And so I think that there are there are you know, we had um, we would have we when my my parents got sick is that that's when we had our we set up um, our WhatsApp our family WhatsApp group. So anything would happen, anyone going to the doctors, it would go on the family group saying, okay, we're at the doctors and this is what the doctor's saying, right? Everybody is updated immediately, right? What needs to be done from here? What doesn't, who can do what and, and how to contribute, right? That is, that is, you know, I think the, the most important thing, right? Communication and collaboration. And the reality is that there are going to be, it's if you, if one is expecting that there's going to be completely fair, it's probably not, right? There are, there are often children who step up um, more than others, right? Whose circumstances there, you know, everyone might have certain obligations, but there is going to be one child probably that is consistently stepping up more, right? And we have to make our intentions. We have to remember that in these circumstances, we're seeking our, our reward from Allah, right? And this is this is your serving and you're honoring your parents and everything. And and you you seek, you see you're you're preparing for the next life in the work that you're doing. And Omar give you a different question just so we can get as many questions as possible, inshallah. How do you set up healthy boundaries for the safety of the elders so they don't get scammed? 
you know, throwing good money after bad uh, and still make sure that they have their dignity, but you want to make sure they don't get into a financial abuse situation. Uh, it's tough. I mean, this is one of those uh, things. Uh, I have a friend overseas. His mother passed away, um, I think, last year, uh, I believe. Um, but anyway, uh, four or five of the sons are all bank CEOs. <laughs> and they're always, you know, uh, when they're visiting their mother, they're always, you know, loading her up with cash. And then they're being surprised, you know, as time went on and she started to have uh, uh, signs of dementia uh, that, you know, she would, you know, give out uh, money to the, the 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 needy in the neighborhood, and she was running out of money very quickly, and they were giving her significant sums, and so one of them took it upon himself to to kind of try to look into it and and be proactive, and those who are around her, whether they're the help or other relatives, have them be a little more observant about what's going on and what what's she doing because they didn't want to limit her being charitable, but at the same time, they wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything nefarious going on. Um, it, it, it's it's very tough, uh, you know, and it's, it's something you have to be very sensitive and caring about, um, you know, when it comes to bank accounts, credit cards, and so on. Uh, thankfully, nowadays, you can put alerts and limits and, and things like that on the accounts, but don't do that without the knowledge of the loved one. Do it sort of... Uh, coordinating for their safety, uh, as you may put it. And, and obviously, each circumstance is different and depending on the condition of the person. Um, and that's the, just the financial sense. Uh, beyond that, I, I think the question was specifically on finances or? It was financial abuse, but I mean, you can talk about other, is there? No, no, it's okay. Let, let's go on to the next question. Okay, just so that's, that, that's good. I think one thing I would add on that is, again, in terms of planning, you're able to plan out. If you have power of attorney, then you're able to 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 do a lot more. And again, do, if you can do this well in advance before somebody's critically ill and not able to make those decisions. Uh, one, one formula that I've seen successful is that well before people get older, it's like, okay, one of the siblings is designated to be a joint account holder on the accounts with the parents. And like Omar was mentioning, they're simply there to monitor transactions. If they start seeing these large transactions randomly happen, then they can be questioning, hey, what's going on here? Uh, so you just have a safety mechanism that you can plan for, uh, inshallah. One last question. I know we're running out of time, but uh, I want to give this question. Uh, says, um, how, do you, how do you balance uh, duties to the loved one versus your own kid? Like you're part of the sandwich generation, essentially. How do you go about balancing looking after your elders, but at the same time, you're looking after your own family and not get burnt out by burning, you know, candle on both ends, as they say. This is where um, we have to utilize our resources, right? How many times have I heard people say, oh, I don't want somebody coming into my house to clean. I don't want somebody coming into my house to, to bathe my parent. They don't want it and things like that, right? But we utilize the help because we have other obligations, right? So we have obligations to our, our parents, but we also have obligations to our spouses, to our children, and we also need to take care of ourselves, right? Um, how many times are do caretakers fall significantly ill, right? Because they are doing so much and they're not taking care of themselves. So uh, we have to really, really promote this balance and and ask for help when we're feeling overwhelmed, if there are certain needs that are coming up and we can't take it, we need to come up with an alternate plan. Did you know the state, like many, many states even have things that are called respite programs, where if someone needs, has something critical and they need someone to look after their caregivers, they have these, these, it's almost like a nursing facility where they've got, you know, social workers and nurses and, and, um, and PCAs, the aides and everything on staff to care for somebody in, in the midst of a crisis, right? So inshallah, we don't, that will not be necessary, right? And that we have other family that we can rely on, but there, know that the, there are a lot of resources that are out there. Go ahead, Omar, you were going to say something? Well, if I can just briefly interject here, um, you know, involving your family 
is necessary, informing them, making fully informed and consulted decisions uh, with your spouse, with your children, and involving them, I think is, is so important. Obviously, sometimes you have to go it alone, and sometimes you have a team with you, and sometimes you find that they're picking up the load more than you, and you're being relieved, uh, you know, maybe sometimes when you even need it more. Uh, and from my experience, the more involved the family members are, the better the bond they'll have, and the positive memories that'll go, they'll go away with. I have two young ones who are uh, seven and uh, eight, almost nine years old. Uh, their experience with their grandfather was very limited to the time when he could barely communicate and he could barely move. Yet they adored him. And because of their interactions with him and them assisting him and even playing catch with the ball with him, you know, my, my father used to enjoy playing volleyball and other sports. And so we, we would play catch with him. Uh, just to keep his movement uh, when he couldn't necessarily walk or do other things as well. Uh, and, you know, those experiences, I mean, you won't believe how much they look favorably back upon the time they spent with him. And I don't think they understood maybe a word or two from him during the time that they spent with him, subhanAllah. Yet it, it's such an important memory for them. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately. We have a lot more questions, but uh, that is the nature of this topic. We wanted to introduce everybody to this critical topic. Uh, we wanted to introduce people to the resources. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation. I want to thank everybody for attending. I would like to thank our panelists uh, for their uh, precious time uh, spending with us. Uh, the feedback link is in the chat. Uh, I think... Uh, it will be, I'll, I'll put it back again in the chat. If you are able to give us feedback, we'd love to hear from you. As I mentioned earlier, the recording will be on our website shortly. And the toolkit is always online on our website. And as I mentioned before, if there's any other type of resources that you're looking for, or you're having any kind of difficulty, reach out to us. We can help find those resources and we can help connect you to some resources, inshallah. We'll do the best we can. With that, we'll, we'll end. Jazakumullah khairan, everybody. Greatly appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we hope this was of benefit. Please keep our panelists and our elders in your dua. And also, please make dua for the Family and Youth Institute. Inshallah, we continue to provide good resources that are useful to the community practically in our daily lives. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfirku wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa